we're seeing a new trend of apps and, and businesses being built. I call it the age of context, where there's companies that are studying us uh, and building products that uh, show us something beyond the age of social. I mean, the age of social brought us Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and Zynga. There's a new age coming. And Q is one of those uh, companies that's showing me stuff out of my ca uh, calendar and my email and other behaviors that I'm having. And it's a really interesting company and it's going to be a lot of fun to talk to. Who are you? Uh, my name is Daniel Gross. I am the CEO of Q. Uh, Q is a company that helps you know what's next in your day based on all of your information, whether it's your email, your calendar, or your contacts. Yeah. And uh, when I don't work, uh, the one other hobby that I cherish a lot is basketball. Um, but that's a little bit about myself and about Q. Shell Israel and I are writing a book about the age of context. We're seeing lots of little companies springing up all over the place. I mean, I had, I had lunch yesterday with Al O'Hara, who's studying the phone. What are you seeing happen in the space and why now? So it seems really that there's a, a lot of companies that have recently evolved that are all about helping you know what's next in your day. And that's very much true to the vision of what we try to do. We try to ingest all of the information that you create or that is thrown at you, whether it's your email, your contacts, or your calendar, or even things like your sales account um, at Salesforce and try to turn that into a manifest, a, a kind of an overview, an intelligent snapshot of what you're gonna need next in your day. And it seems like a lot of these companies have very, very recently, almost out of nowhere, become you know, the, the, the kind of the heart of, of where technology is headed. It seems almost as if like context is what location was in 2009, right? Yeah. Um, and I think there's two reasons why this is becoming an active trend. The first is, the way I see it is, it's really only become possible um, to build applications that revolve around context um, when you have that person's entire life's work in one unified place, which is the cloud. Yeah. Um, so, you, you know, the reality where you had some of your stuff on your work computer and some of your stuff on your home computer is now gone and it's all moving to this one unified place. And so whether it's your friend's photos on Facebook or your email, it's all in a place where software can access it and connect it. And I think that combined with this idea of uh, having very, very good federated identity and API access OAuth being the, the technical term for that, um, leads you with products that tend to be all about connecting different pieces of information. So that's one very important trend. The other one is that it's fairly recent to consider a device that you could take with you that has the computing power of what your phone has today. Yep. Um, and when you combine these two ideas, you're left with, well, if you know everything about me and you're always with me, wouldn't you be able to improve my day-to-day -day life? And the, one of the coolest things when you kind of look at it from a, from a bird's eye view is there's, you know, there's something that's befuddled economists for a very long time called the technology, or sorry, the productivity paradox, right? Productivity grew tremendously from around late 17th, 18th century to around 1960 and 70. And then it kind of stopped to grow at the same second derivative pace. Yeah. And the questions become, why, you know, we have, we have the internet came along and so many new great things, why isn't mankind becoming more and more and more productive? And there's a lot of answers to this, one of them being that we don't have really good tools to measure productivity in the past 30 years because we had 300 years to look back on. We also have TV to waste our time. <laughs> but the other piece of it is in many ways technology has created new ways where we can spend our time, but it's not really yeah. acting on our behalf, right? Meaning, it's great that instead of managing you know, this document that I was going to write on a piece of paper, I can use a text editor for it, but I still have to spend my time there. And I think you're starting to see these new set of companies really create software that ultimately enables people to be more. It's almost like people can all kind of now be super throughout their day, which I think is a very, very human desire. Um, just based on, on the software that you use. And so you don't have to pay someone else to organize your calendar. We'll do it automatically for you just based on your data. And so all that productivity that other people have been seeing as a result of paying someone to manage their calendar for them is now done automatically by a computer. Yeah. Um, and so when, when you put all this together, I think we're at a dawn of a really, really interesting time for computing as a whole. I think we might look back at the next five years and realize these were the dominant years when computers went from being 
tools almost, things that we still have to use to intelligent services that really know what's next in our day automatically. So yeah. I mean, I think you have a very, very cool example, which is, um, you, you know, you're gonna go to the pizza store and you, uh, you have a thing on your to-do list that uh, theoretically your phone should just be able to tell you right what the right pizza store is in case you had to go to the hardware shop to pick, strip, pick up an extra screwdriver. Yeah. That currently doesn't happen today. But when you think of the technical depth you have to go through to answer that question, um, it combines all of the elements that I was talking about. So not only do you have to know everything about me, you also have to understand that when I say, you know, pick up something from, pick up a screwdriver, you have to search for nearby hardware shops, understand that I'm likely to go eat pizza, understand that there's a pizza store nearby here. And so you have to connect a lot of pieces of information. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of a lot of the work that we're doing, understanding your information and connecting the dots between it. Well, and understanding my intent, you know, like, because humans are random. The, yeah. the pro problem is humans are really random. They're not robots, right? Yeah. So I get a brain fart. Oh, I, I'll go down to the, to the hardware store. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, my, my life can reconfigure. Oh, you're over here now. Yeah. Why don't you also go and get a pizza on the way home? Or yeah. why don't you do this? Or uh, another way to look at it is um, the Dubai Pizza Company has a, a, a little button they put on your refrigerator and you push the button and a pizza shows up in 30 yes. minutes and it's your favorite pizza. Now, how did that happen? That button knows a little bit about the context of what you like when you, you know, you, you set up what kind of pizza you want delivered when you push the button right. and it knows a little piece. The nice thing about the mobile phone and Facebook and all these social systems that we've built is that it knows a lot about us. I, I have I put five thousand likes into Facebook, yep. and Spotify knows all my music, and you know Twitter knows all my following behaviors and and co conversation behaviors, right? And so there, it, this system knows a lot about us and yep. can start serving us in a new way that will make Siri seem very quaint and very um, like a Model T almost. I think so. I think being able to proactively help people as opposed to asking them for input is a very, very important piece of the system. Um, one of the reasons why um, we've evolved from, from Greplin to where we are today with Q is we want to have the ability to proactively tell people what will be interesting for them at a given time mm. as opposed to wait for them to, to come first to search. And we actually, it's, it's funny that you mentioned the randomness of humans. This is what search really is as a service for us. Um, being able to consistently be to answer what's next in your day is a really, really tricky question. Yeah. And answering it's going to take a lot of time to figure out. And our approach is to try to build in signal where we can um, and add search in as a kind of a backdrop for everything else in your life. So if you suddenly meet an old friend on the street and you have to pull up like uh, another friend's phone number, being able to instantly search for it becomes very useful and you don't want to be stuck in this reality where yeah. my phone didn't know that I met with this friend because they're not using the service so we don't know where they are and so forth. Um, but as we continue to develop our product, we're going to get better and better and better at answering what's next in your day. Tell me what it does. Sure. Because right, right now you hook up your what, Google Mail, uh, your Google ca Calendar, what, what else do you hook up to it? Well, so we support um, almost more than... Uh, uh, two dozen services that you, you can hook up even things like uh, Basecamp and Dropbox and LinkedIn and Evernote and Salesforce. Um, what Q effectively does today is it combines all of this information um, into an intelligent snapshot of what you're going to need throughout your day. So it'll tie things together like calendar events you might have with the right phone number, the right address where you have to be at. It'll even bring in the email thread that might have spawned that calendar event. Mm. Which is, when you think about it, how most calendar events get created. Yeah. And the reason why this is really important is once you latched onto that email, uh, you can also try to deduce things, well, who sent you this email? Do you happen to know them on Facebook? Can we pull in their profile picture? What's their latest tweet that they made? And you, you're able to kind of create a really, really good story around what you're going to need whenever you put Peter in at 1 p.m. on your calendar. Yeah. So that's the first piece of Q. The second piece of it is it understands the semantic value of a lot of your email. So just by virtue of you getting a flight confirmation or even something like an Amazon purchase in your email automatically places it on your Q. The system knows um, the in relative importance of something like a confirmation number in a flight confirmation email and it understands when your flight's leaving. It understands 
when even if you get like a like an evite from someone when you might have to be where you might have to be and it places it on your queue for you and this is pretty cool for us because it's the first step in your reality where you don't have to manage a calendar it's just managed <coughs> automatically for you um, and over time we're going to add more and more features like this where things will appear on your queue without you doing any work the problem is it you know, I'm one kind of user, and I'm way off here, where I have extremely built out Google calendars. My, I have 5,000 likes on Facebook. Right. Uh, I have really good friend behaviors and all that. Right. And I have, you know, really advanced email systems that have been built over. This. Most people are not like that. Right. Most, most people are more like, you know, my, my wife, my dad. They barely use a calendar, if at all. Uh, like my wife uses a calendar just for a few things, mostly to deal with our kids. Um, most people haven't written a lot of Gmail filters, if any, <laughs> right? And most people have a, a, a hundred Facebook friends, if that many, and have 25 likes, not 5,000. So how do you deal with both of those users and how do you make sure that both of us have a good experience experience pr specifically right out of the box. Right. Well, the, the main problem I think that all of these services ultimately have, ourselves included, and it's a hard technical problem to solve, is how do you get the signal for what's important for you? And I think you're right. Most people don't provide a lot of signal because ultimately their use of technology is based on some type of reward they get. And if you have one event a week that you really care about, maybe you won't put it in your calendar because you'll just remember it, right? Yeah. And so the question becomes, how do you figure out what's next in someone's life when they haven't provided a lot of explicit signal. There's a lot of implicit signal that we're trying to work to extract, but there isn't a lot of explicit one. And you're a pretty big edge case in the sense that you, you know, you've, you've carefully told Facebook, ex and so I hope like your ad experience is really, really tailored. It's actually really good. Yeah. I, people complain about Facebook, and I was like, I don't see any of that yeah. because I'm, my you, usage is so way off. You're giving the system you know, what it wants. Yeah. You're giving the system exactly what you care about. And the question becomes, how do you extract the implicit signal that exists in people's lives? and turn it into something tangible. A very, very, uh, very simple example is this. You put on your calendar, maybe that you know, you're gonna meet with someone, you might put on your calendar, Bob, at 1 p.m. And maybe you'll, you'll even go to the extreme of filing in the location and filing in a description of who Bob is. Basically, you, you'll spend your time manually building what Q will do automatically for you. For what it's worth, you're not alone. Millions of salesmen across America do this every day. They'll spend 15 minutes at the end of the day building a list of what they'll have to do tomorrow. Yeah. And some of them actually just write it on a piece of paper and then get into their car and then type it into their GPS. And when I've spoken to a lot of these guys about Q, the idea that a computer will do it for them automatically is quite shocking. Um, and ultimately will save them a lot of time in their day. Um, but the question becomes, you know, what about people that don't even file these calendar events? Well, what if you just built a service that understood that if I send you an IM and say, hey, do you want to meet tomorrow for coffee at 2 p.m.? automatically places an, an, an item on your screen, just as a result of you having that communication, which is something that I think all humans do, right? We all communicate yeah. on some level. Um, so the question now becomes, can you build something that understands things like relative times and can understand that when I say no, I can't meet you at 2 p.m., doesn't put it on my queue, or that when I reply and there's a quoted email somewhere that someone, someone else mentions a relative time, doesn't screw that up. Yeah. It proves to be a really tricky problem to solve. And so the approach that we've taken is, What's the simplest first step we can take to filling up your screen with valuable content that is actually correct? And it turns out that the best signal in the world as to what's happening next in your life today is your existing calendar, yeah. which is a, a dominant source of signal that Q uses. We're gonna start over time mixing in content there even if it doesn't explicitly appear in your calendar because I think you are right. The goal is to appeal to everyone and my mom doesn't have really a calendar that she maintains. A very analogous reality to think of is you might be the guy who color codes his closet every day. Color codes his closet, make sure everything's in the perfect sort order. Most people in the world don't do that. Empirically, yeah. it would be better for everyone if their closet just sorted itself for them. But nothing does that for us. And this is where technology is really, really important because it does things automatically and it saves human time because you don't have to do it yourself. Yeah. And that's kind of what we're building towards. So, I mean, to answer your question in, one, in, in a nutshell, it's really hard. Um, yeah. And we have a first step at a solution, and over time, over the next few months, we're just gonna continue to expand. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know, when I asked uh, the two guys who started Instagram how they were gonna make money, they sort of gave me the Twitter answer, oh, we'll figure that out someday, you right. know, down the road. 
is are you in the same boat or, or do you have any idea of how this might make money or well so we've been making money since the day we launched the product um, okay. and our current oh. revenue model is very very simple we charge you for the types of services that you add so it's a freemium model if you want to add something like your personal mail account or a facebook account or a twitter account it's free but if you want to add your corporate sales account like enterprise uh salesforce or if you want to add something like Basecamp or high rise or yammer uh, we charge for that we charge five bucks a month or 50 a year and I think over time, there's a lot of really interesting angles that a lot of people have always mentioned as to, well, you know everything about someone, so can't you use that in some way to generate revenue? But the thing that I really like about a freemium model is that it's really, really clear what side you're on. You're going to use our product, and you'll vote with your wallet. And if you happen to like it, you'll pay for it, and we'll get to go to work the next day. And if you don't, we'll have to fix it. Um, and so there's a lot of different approaches to how you make money off something like this. And we've chosen one that's fairly simple to us and just puts us incentivizes us with the user as opposed to potentially being against them. Yeah. However, as every great product evolves, that may change. Um, all I can say is that we're pretty happy with the results that we have now. I, I asked the money thing with context because, with context. Uh, well, the, with contextual apps, you know, I just interviewed Mintigo, who um, basically tracks you uh, as you go around the world. And it, know, it works, Edmunds.com uses Mintigo, and it, if, Edmund sees you hitting their website from a car dealership, they're gonna hit you with a different sales proposal than right. if you're just at home. And they can tell that, right? Right. These things are pretty smart now, and right. they're pretty stalkery, <laughs> you know? Right. And so I wonder what, are you gonna sell my data? Are you gonna do something like that? Are you gonna have an advertising scheme or, or something like that? But it sounds like you're trying to stay on the other side, which is, you know, serve the user and, and have incentives aligned with my with with making a better uh, experience. Well, the core philosophy with anything we build ultimately is going to try to be to deliver the best experience to you possible because I really don't think there's any other way to win as yeah. a product company. And so even if we had some type of model where um, we try to serve you an ad, it would always be in the intent of this this the product will be better with the with this ad, not it by any means to sell your data and it's worth addressing that point specifically we don't get to screw up from a security standpoint. And it might have actually been easier to build Q had we taken a lot of shortcuts that we could have taken around solving a few fairly difficult security problems. And both culturally and practically in our company, we take security really, really, really seriously. And there's a lot of things that we do to keep the integrity of your data safe. And the simplest reason why is just from a pure logical standpoint, if we screw up, that's it, that's the end for us. And yeah. so we would never create any type of interface that would even hint at the fact that we're selling your information, not only because it's wrong, just, and it also just doesn't make sense for us. Yeah. But uh, to be honest, on my phone already are at least five contextual apps that are studying my data in different ways and shoving it up to different servers. And there's a new API from uh, uh, Qualcomm coming out called uh, <sighs> Gimbal. Gimbal. Thank you. <laughs> and it's studying me, and it g can offer me to shove my data up to a cloud. I, I mean, I, well, th I'm not even going to know where all my data is going. And in fact, my data is already being studied anyways by the cell phone companies and other entities that are you know, taking my data and, and uh, you know, putting it places. It's so. worth pointing out the difference between um, moving your Q data from your Q iPhone app to Q servers and selling it to other companies. Yeah. Um, one is a fairly established secure relationship and the other one isn't. Um, I, I feel strongly that companies that don't treat your data with the right respect, I feel strongly that those companies will not succeed long term. Yeah. Um, and we're trying to do things right. And for what it's worth, a company worth mentioning that I think does get an advertising model that's very, very correct Possibly the one of the only ones on the web is Google itself. Hmm. And you know, there's these infamous studies where people tend to get less happy with search results if they take the ads away. Yep. And that's the right way to think about it. Whether or not you build ads, that's, I think, the correct philosophy, is you want to build something that's additive to your product as opposed to you just trying to make a few bucks off the user. Because long term, we're in a capitalistic society, and it's ultimately all going to be about adding value to someone's life. And if you can't really do that, then you're probably not going to have a successful business model. Some of the other problems that uh, on these early uh, contextual apps is we, we live, these apps live in a, a crude world. They don't have a perfect w view of us. For, for instance, I don't put everything on my calendar, right? right. Um, and I sometimes am not very complete in the email back and forth. I mean, Rocky knows this all the time. Um, 
And since we live in a crude world, these things sometimes suggest things to us that are not correct. For instance, another a competitor of yours um, uh, knows that I live on a golf course and keeps suggesting golf kind of activities because he thinks it thinks I like golf. I don't like golf. I just live on a golf course. And there's no way to correct it. There's no way to see why it collected that data or thought what, what its thinking process was. Right. It, it, it's a black box, and I can't, I can't poke the black box and say, stop that. Right. <laughs> uh, where are you going to take your system? I, are there going to be uh, levers that I can poke and say, hey, that, that wasn't correct? Or, uh, you know, or, in other words, send more signal to the system to help it get better? Well, magic, which is I think what you're talking about, which yeah. is what a lot of these product does from, an, from a product perspective is often bad when you don't offer one of two things, either an explanation for it, which is what YouTube used to do. I don't know if you remember back in the day. Yeah. You watched this video, you know, we're recommending this because you watched this other video or the option to get rid of it. Also, it can't be wrong all the time. That's a very clear problem for everyone. And I, I think a lot of our competitors maybe have been like sl ever so slightly reckless in their confidence of the recommendations that they give. And we try from, to, when we launch the product, operate from a very secure, if not slightly limiting standpoint of, if it's on your calendar, it's interesting. If it, we can extract it from your email and it has specific times that it's interesting to you, we'll put it on queue, otherwise we won't. There's a lot of areas where we could have added context, but it could have been wrong. And as we slowly start to uh, investigate those areas and add more and more of those things, for example, you seem to walk around this area a lot perhaps this is what you call home, um, we'll also add the other lever, which is, I think, I believe a necessary one, which is what if we're wrong, and we'll let you correct the system. And over time, the system will learn. Um, but I think this all goes down to, you know, every new technology when it comes out isn't perfect. Yeah. Um, and it's gonna take, it might take, a, you know, a, a couple of iterations to correct it. Um, and it's definitely something that we're working on, and I'm sure that ev anyone with their, you know, head on right would also be working on too, is letting, giving you the ability to say, no, you're, you're probably wrong. Um, but it's worth noting that, that philosophically we try to operate from what's the simplest version of this product that we could put out there that is at least explicitly accurate. Even if it doesn't have a lot of content for everyone, at least it has good content for those who would potentially use it frequently. Yeah. Um, where, do you, where do you think this world's going with the, the Google Glasses are coming in, I don't know, 12 to 18 months? Are, is that going to radically change what you're able to do? Are you are you hoping Google does something so that you can build a new kind of app in my eye when I have a computing device on 100% of the time instead of having to look down and you know open it up? Well, I think the first thing that's going to change, um, just because you mentioned the iPhone, is the right now there's this very very I think interesting product problem with the iPhone where the value of a push notification is constant, meaning you always get either buzz, buzz, based, you know, based on, on an app-on-app -app basis, there's one option for a push notification, which yeah. is to alert you to something. There's no ability to say, well, this might be interesting to you, or if you happen to be holding your phone in your hand, we should show this to you. Otherwise, we shouldn't bother you about it. Ah. And those types of features, I think, are gonna be very, very necessary for apps like ours and many others to succeed. Because, speak of signal, the main signal we actually don't have much now is we know where you are, um, we know if you might be indoors or not, based on maybe if you're using Wi-Fi, um, but we don't really know where your eyes are focused on or what mental state you're in, and that proves to be very important when you try to build a product that ours is, is, is trying to do. Yeah, because if I keep shoving messages at you while you're being interviewed, it'll, it'll bother you, Exactly. Right? So it's I'm, not serving you. Exactly, and as a data point, um, right now, your only option is to turn your phone on silent, or you know, in, in iOS 6 they have a don't send me any notifications feature. And that's, a, I think, a good hack at a solution, but it isn't the real solution. The real solution is notifications should have a, a gradient of importance, effectively. And different interactions should encourage different notifications. Um, and I think when you speak to a lot of people about how frustrated they get with push notifications, it's because of this reason when you really dig into it. Um, and I think, uh, hopefully, over time, both Apple and Android and, and the other uh, phone developers will create an ecosystem where notifications aren't all single function. Like, they can change their variant. Okay. Um, so that's one thing that I think will change over time. There's also, I think, a lot of really interesting new technology, be it Google Glass or others, where um, people are turning computers into uh, things that can passively put information in front of our eyes instead of us actively have to go look at them. And we're getting watches like Pebble and the basis monitor. Right. One of the largest things that I think is changing is 
computers used to be big because they had to be. And right now, computers can be any size you want them to be. And so that's why we're seeing things like a tablet or a watch, because we can put computing anywhere we want it. You can put it in front of your eye, it turns out. Um, and that op unlocks a lot of really, really new cool ideas. Um, I, I, I don't necessarily know what the perfect permutation of passive computing may be. It might turn out that glass needs a few iterations before it's ready to hit mainstream. It may turn out that it's th the best idea since sliced bread. Um, all I know is that from our perspective, we'll just go to whatever platform appears to be dominant because I think the most important question that will need to be answered, um, you know, maybe 10 or 5 years from now, is what system actually knows the most about you so that it can, regardless of what the form factor is, the question I think will become the knowledge itself. And that's the direction we're headed in. Yeah. Um, a lot of that knowledge, though, is in silos, yeah. right? Facebook knows a little bit, Spotify knows a little bit, Google Mail knows a lot, right. Gmail and Google Calendar knows a lot. I, my data is spread all over. Foursquare knows a lot. Yep. You know, it's spread all, all over these silos that aren't really hooking together yet. This is why I think it's really important that the company that builds the type of service that we're building is not fundamentally incentivized to destroy any one of those other siloed companies. I think a lot of the other companies that are building possibly competing products um, ultimately compete in other markets with a lot of these companies, right? And so I think, there you go, push notification. Yep. Right? Um, I think Google and Facebook aggressively compete with each other, which limits, I think, Google's ability to interact with something like Facebook's API. The great thing about us is not only are we not competing with any of these companies, really, we're also aiding them. You know, ultimately, what happens at the end of the day is if you become more engaged with a LinkedIn contact through Q, you're very, very likely to friend them on LinkedIn. And so we actually help a lot of these services. And I think when you look at the solution to you know, a, a era of context, I think it's going to have to be with a company that doesn't explicitly side with any one of the existing data silos, which is why it's been really important to us to be independent. Um, because we don't work well if you can get everything except your Salesforce data, or yeah. everything except your Dropbox data. Um, because it turns out that you have to get everything to know everything. Interesting. Um, so that's kind of our philosophy about that. But I agree with you. It's, it's, um, you know, it's not that everything's in your hard drive anymore. It's worse than that. It's part of the data in your hard drive is owned by one company, and then another part is owned by another company. And you know, humans have egos, and they don't always get a chance to work together. And so that type of competition leaves opportunity for us. Very cool. Well, thanks for coming in and talking to me a little bit about what you're doing. I, I love the app. It's, uh, it's early days. It's like an Apple One right now. It's, it, it's oh, like, definitely. You know, it's for the, good, it's for the uh, early adopters right now, but it, it's getting better every week. I notice it's getting better. Well, so. we're, we're burning the midnight oil, making it better. So I, over time, I think you'll see it getting smarter and smarter and smarter. Very cool. Where do I uh, get it and learn more about you guys? Uh, so you can check us up at queup.com. It's in queupyourday.com. Uh, and uh, you could also download the app on the app store. It's just named QCUE. Uh, and uh, we also have a website, it's worth mentioning, that offers a lot of the search functionality that I mentioned um, that you can check out as well. Very cool. Thank you so much. Thanks for taking the time. Appreciate it.